Good evening, and welcome to the Prince George's Memorial Library System virtual events. My name is Roberta Phillips, and it's my honor to be the library CEO. I'm really happy to introduce tonight's program, which is co-presented with the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and our friends at the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission. We are thrilled to welcome New York Times bestselling author and physician Michelle Harper to our series that focuses on Black identity in America. The series has featured Calvin Baker, Bassey Ickby, and continues on Wednesday, October 7th with Eddie Cloud Jr., who discusses his new book on James Baldwin. It's also my pleasure to introduce two colleagues who will be hosting tonight's program. They are Hawa and Nick. Hawa is a member of the Glen Arden Branch Library team and a prolific bookstagrammer and reader. And Nick is our fearless COO for communication and outreach. So if you are interested in supporting PGCMLS virtual events, please consider making a donation to the PGCMLS Foundation at PGCMLS slash donate. Have a great evening and thank you for being here. Thank you. Hi everyone, so I'm gonna introduce our guest for the evening. Michelle Harper has worked as an emergency room physician for more than a decade at various institutions, including as chief resident at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx and the emergency department at the Veterans, Veterans Affair Medical Center in Philadelphia. She is a graduate of Harvard University and the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. The Beauty and Breaking is her first book. Thank you, nice to join you. Well, welcome. Here. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you, Howard, for the intro. Um, would you like us to call you Michelle or Dr. Harper? Michelle is fine. Michelle, okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us uh, here in Prince George's County today. This is a really exciting moment for us. I picked up your book uh, right when it came out and was blown away by the story and how um, warm your personality is. And it just shone through from the first page to the end and everything that um, we've, discussed between the three of us on social and everything, we, we see that the personality continues and it's a real thing. Um, so we really are grateful for, um, for your spirit and your willingness to share some time with us tonight uh, with our community here in Prince George's County. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll kick things off. How and I will go back and forth with questions. We might um, go off on tangents depending on what uh, saucy topics we get into. And uh, we'll get into Q&A towards the end with the audience. Uh, just as a preface, everyone is welcome to check out uh, Dr. Harper's book or Michelle's book on our uh, library website, pgcmlas.info. It's available in hard copy, ebook, audiobook, and you can also purchase a copy through Loyalty Bookstores, which is a wonderful indie bookstore uh, organization, both in Silver Spring and DC, and you can visit their website. Uh, just Google Loyalty Bookstores to check that out. Um, so, Michelle, tell us all about growing up in D.C. because that is such an important part of your life story that I think so many of us in Prince George's County um, can relate to. It, it is. And I love D.C. and I miss D.C. <laughs> and I can't wait for the world to open up again to go back there. Now, my my childhood there was was difficult. It was a little challenging. I mean, I grew up in Northwest D.C. Um, for most of it was near the DC Silver Spring line on, uh, on the DC side and went to National Cathedral School um, or through 12th grade. So that's where I grew up. Um, it was difficult though, because as I speak in my book, which is a memoir, I grew up in an abusive household with a father, father for a batter, uh, a batter for a father. So part of what I speak about is my journey in healing from that, and then it's interwoven between patient stories. And actually, if it would be helpful to people, because I'm sure not everyone's read the book, I can read part of sure. the beginning just to, just to give a little context to the discussion. That'd be great. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, this is part of the introduction. As I cradled my patient's head in my hand, I looked past the watery wells of his eyes. For a moment, I didn't notice the blood that ran in rivulets across my gloves as it poured from his scalp, or the bits of gray and white brain matter that dotted the sheets, the beeping of the monitors around me, the popping sound of IV catheter tops being flicked off by the nurses, 
the screeching of wheels as equipment was dragged across linoleum floors, the nurses and techs yelling directions at one another, the stifled gasps erupting from the two medical students on their first ER shift, attempting in vain not to be startled. All were drowned out as I stood over this young man and tried to ease his agitation. This is the part of being a doctor that medical school doesn't cover, that case reviews don't prepare you for. This is the part you can't really know until you're in the moment. You are the person responsible for saving the human life that slowly slips through your fingers while silently begging for final redemption under the demanding fluorescent lights. I am the doctor whose palms bolster the head of the 20 year old man with a gunshot wound to his brain. I support the baby as she takes her first breath outside her mother's womb. I hug the wife whose husband is dying from advanced liver disease as she implores the universe to take away his pain. I claim no special powers, nor do I know how to handle death any better than you. What I know is that for 36 hours a week, I reside in the melee that is a hospital emergency room where I'm called upon to be salve, antidote, and sometimes charon. Most of the time, my job is to keep death at bay. When I am successful, I send the patient back out into the world. When I'm not, I am there as life passes away. I'm not so deluded as to think that I alone am capable of making that kind of difference. I'm well aware that the determination of who lives and who dies doesn't happen at my hands alone. There are times when, Despite the designs of any patient, family member, friend, or doctor, death will come. Then I am witness. What I can do is be the fairy woman who holds the body as the last breath escapes. The one who, like the night sentinel, calls out the hour and does her best to convey that all is well. Like everyone, I am in this world for only a brief time. And as for many, blessings abound in my life. And they abound amid the struggle, amid my struggle. Over the decades, I've learned to cultivate a personal state of stillness. As a child, that stillness grew from a dissociation I stumbled upon that allowed me to better endure life with a father who was a batterer and with a family legacy of victimhood. As a black woman, I navigate an American landscape that claims to be post-racial. When every waking moment reveals the contrary, an American landscape that requires all women to pound tenaciously against the proverbial glass ceiling which we've since discovered is made of palladium, the kind of glass that would sooner bow than shatter. When I began writing this book, I had started over. My marriage to my college sweetheart had ended. I had moved to a new city to start a new job. Plagued with doubt, I found myself having to reevaluate my life. Living through such changes was difficult. Now I see those junctures when everything I had counted on came to an abrupt end as a privilege. They gave me the opportunity to be uncertain and in that uncertainty grew opportunity. So just a little piece at the beginning. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So so that's a little bit of the context where, yes, I came from DC and then as I speak about in the book, um, my journey in healing from that childhood and then going on to becoming a physician and ER doctor. Um, and some lessons I learned along the way um, through my interactions with patients. And, and, and that's really why I wrote this book, not only to explore my own healing, but it was really important for me to explore interconnectedness as human beings, because in this life, we all have challenges. We're all navigating something. And I find that in those challenges, I, I don't romanticize trauma, but in those challenges, there is opportunity, I feel, to build better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so since we talked a little bit about healing, you touched on it a little bit. Um, my question is, um, healing is a central theme in your book. So at what point in your life or your career did you realize that you wanted to focus more on healing? When I was young, really, um, and I do touch, there, were, there are so many different stories that have made a difference um, in my life and experiences. And some of the things I saw and experienced in my childhood, you know, I, I talk about an example of when my father was, uh, my, my brother was trying to protect my mother and my father ended up biting my brother's hand. 
And that was a moment that really changed me. And I remembered it so vividly, just for me, the savagery of that act to bite another human being and somebody who's in your family gave me the sense that anything was possible at any moment in terms of danger. Um, and that I would have to figure out a way of saving my, doing what I can to help my family and also saving myself. And so when I went to places like the emergency department, when my brother needed care, when I went there and I saw all manner of life converging there, whether it was a little girl brought in by her father who needed um, a attention for a cut or a man brought in on a stretcher and it, the EMS, the, the medics are actively working on him, trying to pump his heart back to life. When I saw all kinds of people in this place looking for something, looking for another life, a better life, a way through their pain and suffering, that was a time when I got a glimpse that there is possibility that 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 what I'd experienced in my home wasn't the only way to live, that I saw some of these same people skip out healed. So that was a glimpse into a world that was really appealing for me. And I wanted to be support for other people. So, and that was an experience I had when I was young, when I was a teenager, and that stayed with me. So that's really when I started formulating that decision and the commitment. Very cool. Um, Sorry if there's an echo, folks. Uh, we're trying to work on that as we go here, but we don't want to completely stop. Okay. A little bit of an echo, but we'll keep going. Um, there's something really special about the way you tell your story um, because you do see a lot more of the human experience than most of us just as, an, as a result of your work. But the way that you tie in your own experiences and how your personal experiences inform your presence in your work life um, it, for me, it took, uh, my takeaway was that, you know, the, we all have struggles and some of us face more struggles because of the systemic problems that exist and that's awful and we all have a duty to kind of participate in trying to fix that. Um, but the struggles are human struggles um, and no matter where we're coming from or what privilege we've got or what upbringing we have, everyone does have these struggles and there are these moments in time where our life is hanging by the thread and we would be so lucky to have Michelle as our doctor at that moment. Um, but yeah, what did you go into the, the, the book with that kind of intention or was that just something that resulted from the writing process of kind of combining the two journeys of the personal and the professional? Oh, that was always my intention actually. Um, so I, I, I started writing this just because I, I had stories to tell that resonated me, that stayed with me and I wanted to reduce them to writing. And I hadn't really uh, fully formulated a plan with what would happen next. And then when it was done <clears throat> and I said, okay, I guess it's try and get published or something and figured it out <laughs> and, and, and started working with um, a, a publishing house. That's when actually they had to pull more out of me to put more of my story in because mostly it was about my patients. Um, because from the very beginning, I didn't want it to be an ego, uh, egoic work. It was really important for me to show our interconnectedness. So that was always the focus and of primary importance to me, really. Cool. Thank you. How would you want to do the next one? You're muted too. Oh, you're muted. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to ask you about the title, The Beauty and Breaking. It's so captivating. It catches your attention right away. Like I had the book sitting on my bed as I was preparing for this a couple of weeks ago and my sister saw it. She was like, wow, what is that about? Like, I really want to read that. So how did you, um, like what's the story behind it or, or the meaning? So, so I, I am so proud of this title because I picked the title and it's, awesome. and they kept it. And I'm really proud of it. <laughs> and actually, I didn't even come up with the title till the work was fully done. It was, I don't know what I called it. I don't think I really, I don't, I don't think I really called it anything. But once it was, once it was done, when I was bringing it out in the world, trying to get a book deal, um, right before then is when I 
got the title and I, it drew on what I felt about life and our experiences and how, and the opportunity in those challenges. And specifically I speak about, um, there's an art form that I, and I'm about to butcher this title and I'm very, very sorry, but there's a Japanese art form called, one of the names is Kintokoroi. And in that art form of pottery that has been broken is repaired uh, by an amalgam of precious metals. So the thinking is that now you have this ceramic item where the breaks are highlighted in, in yellow gold or platinum because it's that much more beautiful for what it has been through. It's that much more beautiful after the mending and we don't wanna hide it. That's part of its experience. That's part of its journey and that is part of its art. And so I feel that we as human beings are the same. And so that's why this had to be called the beauty and breaking. Very cool. That's so um, beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, R Roberta's got a question. We'll throw it in just for kicks. <laughs> Who should play you when Reese Witherspoon scoops up the rights to your book? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's a really good question. That's a really good question. So I don't, I don't know all the actresses who are out there, but I want someone who has a mastery of their craft and a depth and wisdom to their soul, like an old soul. Somebody petite, because I'm only five one, and dark skin really? and athletic because I do yoga all the time. <laughs> so someone like that. And I really, really love Cynthia Arrivo. Oh yeah, oh my God. Her <laughs> voice, I've, I've heard her a couple of times. Oh my God, it's just like, the recordings already like blow your mind, but hearing her live, she commands a room like I've never seen anyone. Oh, I know, yeah. and she's yeah. a powerhouse. And she's also tiny, but powerful. Yeah. yeah. Someone yeah. like that. <laughs> Very cool, good question, Roberta. Um, the, there were moments in your career that you de describe in the book uh, where you kind of gather the the fortitude within yourself to kind of take a stand for for righting wrongs and such. Um, can you talk about a bit about some of those moments and also what went be what went into your thinking to kind of prepare yourself for taking that stand when it might have been very uncomfortable or at your own expense professionally in some cases? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Huh. So an example, and I, there, there's there's two that really come to mind. Um, but one where the police brought in a man who was he was under arrest, and they wanted me to examine him. The patient did not want to be examined. The patient was of sound mind, and they said the allegation was he swallowed drugs, and you've got to get these bags of drugs out. That's what you just got to do. Um, so. At, at first, my I, I heard the patient and police, this ruckus going on in the triage area where patients are first brought in. I was at my workstation. I was the, the attending physician, the doctor in charge of that section at that time of day. Um, and one of my residents, who is a person that I supervise, so it's like my, my student, uh, went over to go try and manage the situation. And I heard her say to the patient, you just have to do what we say. This is what's gonna happen to you. Which then I had to intervene because that's obviously not the solution. Um, so I walked over, he's a black man and I'm a black doctor. We were the only two black people there. I was the doctor in charge and he's the man under arrest. And um, I, I did my own evaluation of him. He, he agreed that I could speak to him and he was fine. He wasn't intoxicated, he wasn't altered. So he has rights. So he said he didn't want any further evaluation and he wanted to be, to be discharged. So I discharged him. Um, but before I could, my resident called hospital legal and ethics because she didn't agree with what I was doing and she wanted to get the hospital to go above me and force this man to be examined. The hospital then informed her that 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 I am correct and that, that is illegal. Um, not only is it illegal, it's unprofessional, it's unethical, and we could do this man harm by doing that, which is against everything we stand for as physicians. 
So in that moment, it was important to me to take that stand because I am there to do what is in the best interest of a patient, to, to do no harm and to heal. So that is why I intervened. It was also important for me to take that stand because this is an example where not only is it demonstrating problems in policing where this man was thought to have no personal sovereignty, no autonomy, but it also shows the problems in medicine. Neither was I. I wasn't thought to have any autonomy, sovereignty, any authority. Um, so we have those same, the issues of structural racism, they're in our house too. So it's important for me to tell that story, to amplify that story so we can address it because nothing can be fixed unless the story is told, unless the problem is named, identified, and then addressed. And so for me, so yes, is it is it potentially risky? I mean, there's been other situations, um, like, like one where I told recently in an essay where uh, I could have been arrested, but I have to use whatever power and privilege I have to do the right thing. I feel like that's what we're called to do as humans. When I was reading that part, when you got to the part where they were like, they basically confirmed what you said. I was like, yes. Cause I was yes. just like, I was like, how dare she try to go over your head? Like you didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> I know, so, I know. It, it's sad that it had me on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then when they were just like, you know, where you, I guess they it just seemed like they were just so used to people just doing what they say. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm listening. No. Yeah, you're right. It, it was commonplace. And that's part of the reason why she did it, because this is just what she explained is this is just what we do. Well, then we need to change what we do. We need to look at that because there's an issue. <laughs> So that's why. And it, you know, it's interesting because that 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 issue with policing specifically is coming up a lot. And um, I, that was an experience that I had. This was years ago. I mean, this is maybe oh, five or so years ago now. So none of this is new. It just continues. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm hoping. One thing I find really energizing about the current climate. I mean, there, there's so much tragedy and pain and suffering, but it seems that there's an, there's a, there's a interest that's a little different now that people are taking to the streets and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful. And I'm not, I'm not often optimistic, <laughs> but sometimes I am a little bit. And, and I'm actually really hopeful now that this energy is different and people are ready to take action. So, yeah. so, so I'm really hopeful that this is this is part of a larger movement. How are you? Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, it's my turn, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what have you turned to during this pandemic and COVID for your own personal well-being? So it's it's always okay. Some of my some of my go-to's always are yoga, the, the physical practice of yoga that I do constantly, like all, all the time. Um, there's that meditation. Um, I love walking meditation specifically. And maybe it's because I live in an um, urban environment where I don't have much connection to nature otherwise, but I, I love going on walks and being away from all the energy in my condo and having like fresh air and light and just clearing my mind. That's really important to me, um, healthy food. One benefit, I have a long commute to work. One benefit is I listen to um, spiritual teachers like Eckhart Tolle, I listen to his audiobook on my way into work just to get myself ready for whatever might happen <laughs> at work. <laughs> Those are my go-tos. And then I've started reading um, other people I consider spiritual teachers. Jo Am I pronouncing her name right? The Poet Laureate, um, Joy Harjo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just got one of her book of poems. And so part of my practice is every day I'll just read one of them as a, cool. a meditation. So those are my go to currently. Those sound delightful. Yeah. Um, 
you had a, a, a really uh, amazing educational path. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that journey and um, how the journey ended up aligning with what your expectations were for yourself going into pursuing your advanced degrees and also what your family's expectations had been of you at, at that time? Um, well, um, okay, the educational path, right? There was NCS, that was a great experience and, and right, undergrad, <laughs> that was, that was, that was a real, you know what? Then there was undergrad, then medical school, residency, and, you know, some studying abroad. I didn't talk about actually studying abroad part. Um, Where did you go? In Ecuador for a little while and Costa Rica. And uh, Costa Rica was amazing and did some volunteer work and learning Spanish, which was super useful because I did that before uh, resident, um, after undergrad, so before my uh, medical education. And that was extremely useful for the South Bronx. And so I'm really grateful for it in many ways. Um, so there was all of that. Undergrad was a really good education in um, elitism and elitism in America. So it wasn't, it was not particularly pleasant, but it did prepare me for the structural racism and, and sexism that I would see later, I found out. Um, so yeah, that's how it went. And then, but in terms of my, my family expectations, I was always, and this is a new question. I know we were talking a little bit in the beginning about you know how similar questions always come up. This one has not yet come up, so you did it. <laughs> um, but actually I was always, I was one of those kids who was always harder on myself. Mm -hmm. So I set my expectations for myself. I didn't, I don't, I don't really compete with other people. I, I feel like there's enough for everyone. I want everyone to do well. And I, I compete with myself in terms of, am I accomplishing my own goals? So when I was younger, if I didn't, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but I'm just gonna tell you, cause you asked the question. But if I didn't feel like I did well enough on my assignment, I would put myself on punishment. And so like my, my mom would say, do you think you can come off restriction to come to the mall with us? <laughs> oh, so that's kind of how it was. So yeah, I just, yeah. So I have my expectations for myself and I make my plans and that's how it goes. <laughs> did that approach continue through undergrad and then medical school for yourself or did you uh, kind of slacken up on that? point not really i mean I, I stopped putting myself on restriction but <laughs> <laughs> that was just a high school thing <laughs> very cool <laughs> um I, so cute. <laughs> yeah and if, if you're willing i'd love to hear more about the time in costa rica and ecuador um especially since we haven't had a chance to read about that part oh yeah well i haven't written about it at all and it was um it was service learning abroad. Um, so when I was in, in Ecuador, it was mainly in inner city Guayaquil and some day trips to Quito. And I was taking classes in Spanish language and also literature just because I enjoy it and um, volunteering in a clinic. And it was a really rural clinic. I mean, there was no, no supplies and I, I happened to be interested in in healthcare, so I was assigned to a physician there, and we would we were just out, out in the campo and um, mainly doing health checks and screenings, um, giving information on nutrition, whatever we could do with no supplies to community that didn't have any access to healthcare. Um, and I was at a shorter time in Costa Rica, and that was that was a lot of enjoyment taking Spanish volunteering just a little awesome. bit and going to rainforest and eating delicious food and taking classes and dance while I, while I was there. And I was the only American English speaking person there um, who didn't speak Spanish, learning how to dance with uh, the people in the community who apparently didn't know how to dance either. So <laughs> that was fun. Very cool. Roberta wants me to ask you a question in Spanish, but I'm going to oh! take some time to formulate that question and invite Howard to take it away. For <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see 
hopefully oh. it's a medical question. I... <laughs> <laughs> so the part that's that stuck is the medical Spanish, so you guys that. <laughs> that makes sense. So in the book, you share many examples of the highs of being a doctor. Can you share a favorite moment with a patient or a colleague? A favorite moment. Oh, God. These are the happy hour stories now. <laughs> I know. I know. A favorite moment. I mean, top, top of mind, now top of mind right now is the book, really. And one of my most rewarding moments, and, and and I don't want this pause to be taken as there there aren't favorite moments because there are, <laughs> there are positive rewarding moments, but but one of the moments that that resonates with me is uh, when I was speaking to a patient, and I call her Honor, and um, it was it was difficult. I was seeing her in the psychiatric section of the emergency department. Um, and this was at the VA hospital. So it was, really, it was really common for people to come in who may have some kind of substance abuse issue or mental health issue, or often both, coming in to get cleared to go on to their next program, whether it was a work assignment or a sober house. And clear just means a medical doctor blesses them saying they're okay to go there. There's no active medical issue. So I was seeing her there. And she was become she was getting sober, um, and there was really nothing to do. It was the end of my shift. She was a healthy young woman. It was easy. My shift was was running over. I needed to get home. There was no medical issue, and, and I I could have just left. But as I was leaving, I, I felt like there was more. I felt like I needed to ask her. She had mentioned um, she there was a, a surgery and a, a trauma she had. And I felt like if I just left without asking, I would somehow be complicit in silencing her. And I, I was thinking all these things. I, I know objective evidence of any of that, but that's what I felt. So I turned around and asked her um, if she wanted to speak about it, if she wouldn't mind telling me. And that's when she revealed to me that she that this trauma she was um, healing from was being raped while she was overseas. Uh, stationed in, in the military, not only by her colleague in the military, but also by her supervisor. Um, and the military handled it terribly. And not only did they commit this crime against her body and spirit, but also then they tried to ruin her career and take away her livelihood as well. And she had since been reassigned and she was getting better and had a new therapist who was helping her. Um, there was no accountability, at least at that point, for those people and structures who did that to her. But we, but, but she herself was finding a way forward. And I remember that as when we finished speaking about that, she had expressed that she had never really told the whole story to anyone before. And it felt good for her to tell her part of the story, to get it out. It felt freeing. And I'm, I'm sure part of part of what felt good to her too was the validation that I gave her that they they were wrong, and that she does deserve better, and she does deserve to feel okay, and she deserves to have a life that is rewarding. And so that's one of those moments for me is is a highlight of doing this work, because while she's doing everything she can to survive. I feel there have to that there have to be people like me and you know her new therapist and other people who can be there to support her in that and then also hopefully take actions for accountability and to change structures so that this doesn't happen to other people. So that's what I find, you know, that that interaction with her is so rewarding for me. I mean, it was for her, a byproduct is that it was rewarding for me. And then doing this next step of work and hopefully being part of positive change personally and, and socially, that that too is rewarding. It just seemed like you always just know the right or comforting thing to say, which I'm sure I had, wasn't always like that. But like, when did you feel like you could finally, or when did you feel like you started to kind of get a hang of, you know, just 
comforting people, I guess. Right. And it's, you know, and it's, it's a mix because um, sometimes the right thing to say and the most supportive thing to say is to establish clear boundaries. And it may not feel so nice to someone that you're establishing boundaries and you're not, you know, enabling them. Uh, honor is not a case of that, but but so I feel like it's a, it's a balancing act, and what nice and supportive looks like can vary depending on the interaction and right. developing that insight. And 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 I'm since I'm human, it's it's not always perfect. <laughs> Let me see. But developing that insight, I think, is a process with time. I, I don't and and practice. And I don't think there's any substitute for time and practice. And, and it's definitely not something I could have done when I was 20 years old or 25 years old. We'll, we'll stop with counting the years at 25, but you get my point. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have two different questions that I really want to ask right now, but I got to pick one. So um, the, the question is, um, in your work, you have to adapt your response to the person and the personality because sometimes you obviously have to de-escalate a situation. Other times you have to provide more comfort. Other times someone's in a total crisis and you've got to kind of get them into uh, stability. Um, how do you how do you adjust your your interactions with individuals and the families that are around them? You know, if it's a kid who's having a crisis to someone who's kind of aware that they're dealing with a terminal situation and still conscious. Just to kind of as an example of the range of things. Don't right. need to cover them specifically. And that's where I think it's just, it's just a, a centering process for me. Um, for example, you know, and this is an example pre-pandemic um, when, when there could be visitors, for example, in the emergency department. But, you know, th there was a child who had some head trauma. There was an accident. He was a young boy. And so I, I had to tend to him. Meanwhile, his mother was a little frantic. There was a strange dynamic between both parents. The, the father was obstructive and difficult, but this, I forget how old, five or six year old is my patient and I have to make sure there's no emergency. So I had to make sure the father wasn't around and then try and, and you know, ask him to leave and then try and assess this patient while managing the terror and discomfort of the mother. And then once I stabilized this young boy, and, and it was really actually sad because I could tell in his response, like when we had to put an IV in, for example, and he just didn't move at all. He just lay there on the stretcher, which is not a normal response for a child. And he wasn't that sick. And it made me feel that he had been through a lot. I don't know what he had been through, but he was used to dulling his emotions. And from what I saw from the parents, I could tell that there was a lot of dysfunction going on. Going on. So it's a situation where I had to take care of him, get Child Protective Services involved to make sure he would be safe when this was all over. So I, I use that example to say, we have to do a centering process, not only between different patient rooms, but also in one patient room where there's multiple actors. And so it's just a practice of being present and just constantly centering and presencing in one room and then onto the next, and then onto the next, and then onto the next. And that's just how it goes, which is why I do yoga and listen to Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> just a quick follow up on that. Um, how are, or what are some of the ways that you and your colleagues in those situations kind of give each other signals or know how to re respond to what the other colleague needs in order to just intuitively go give that one person the support that they need without having to verbalize it? Because I'm imagining that sometimes verbalizing the instruction or the request might add fuel to the fire in some instances. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, of course, eye contact <laughs> and um, and speaking outside the room. But I will say that much of the communication is verbal, though, because if, if there isn't, there's there can be a lot of errors that happen. So we get a sense of each other as it. I mean, like any team, you get a sense of who each other are and you can read body language because we work together all 
the time. So, so then we get a sense when, when this, and, you know, and the, and the physician is the one leading the team. So for example, the nurses know like when this doctor goes quiet, this is what it means. <laughs> when this doctor looks at me this way, this is what it means. Like when this nurse, like this, there's this one like amazing nurse in particular, she, she can just tell, like if somebody's sick, if I see her going to the room quickly and like moving quickly, then I know there's an issue and I won't even ask anything. I will just go. So, so it, it, I think it's just a matter of, of teamwork and knowing each other and then the flow of the department and just having experience. Well, thank you. Um, Howard, do you want to do a couple more and then we'll switch to audience in a few minutes? Sure. How do you see the systemic racism in American society reflected in the medical profession? Were you surprised by this when you entered the field? Mm, was I surprised? I thought like we kind of touched on that already, though, didn't we? Well, yeah, we did. I Maybe mean, we did, did, but I mean, there's more to say, though. <laughs> well, I have another question. Then. I have another question. How about um, how that um, how that shows up in the different types of hospital settings that right. you work in? Because I mean, you work in some very there different. There is more settings. to say. I mean, I'm not. Was I surprised by it? Um, sadly, by the by the time I was an attending physician, I I wasn't um, just because of what I had already experienced in undergrad and medical school. So so I wasn't. Um, but how it how it shows up is in in uh, so many different ways. I mean, well, one of the things we talk about a lot is disparities in care and poor health outcomes for like women and people of color and studies showing that if we had more diversity in physicians or when people have physicians like who are women and people of color and from different backgrounds there are better health outcomes we have studies on that there is research we, we should follow it and the fact that two percent of physicians are black women that's far below the numbers of black women in this country so it shows up in disparities in care. It shows up in disparities in hiring, in promotions. It shows up, oh, it shows up. So in, a, in every hospital anyway, there's a hallway, a hallway. And this is probably in, in, I don't know if it's in other industries also, but in medicine, there's a hallway of photos. And um, these are portraits of hospital leadership over time. And these portraits, doesn't matter what, uh, it almost doesn't matter what hospital you go to. There's very few exceptions, but these portraits are invariably of old, quite old, <laughs> sometimes a little less old white men who do their gender in this kind of like heteronormative way. Like these are the portraits. This is what the hospital says. This is what we believe in. This is, this is who we promote. These are the stakeholders. That's how it shows up also. Um, and so it will change one day when those portraits, and I did see there was this one place, this one like Mecca where they took me to the hallway and it was women and different shades of color. I, I couldn't tell looking at them, like how any of these people did their gender. Like it was different ages. It was fantastic, but that's what change looks like. And until we get there, until that's the hallway in most of this, much of this country where there's diversity, um, we're not gonna be at a place of equity. Thank you. There was um, one, one uh, just shout out that I'd like to throw out for someone uh, in the medical community in, in DC. Uh, her, her, she works at uh, Children's National, which just opened up a new facility near some of our libraries in Prince George's County uh, at the Woodmore Town Center, uh, which is focusing on uh, outpatient surgical stuff and regular um, checkups and such. But her name is Martha Parra, and she is a Colombian American, uh, amazing, amazing VP of. Um, clinical support services, and she has a wonderful team, and she is just so 
she brings this energy to the work that the whole hospital like is inspired by. And that's what happens when it stops being all old white dudes to put it. <laughs> and it's, you know, that's not to say that all old white dudes, you know, can't contribute to things, but um, we, we can't serve our communities well if we're not representing and reflecting them at every level of every institution in every hall of power in every stakeholder space. And thank you for, uh, posing all of that so succinctly and um, eloquently in a way that's, I think, easy for people to understand and also uh, appreciate where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, another shout out uh, to Dr. George Askew, who is the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for us in Prince George's County. He oversees all the health department and uh, the library and several other agencies, and he's been a great force uh, bringing all of us together with the heart of a physician uh, but with the mindset of a public health expert, and he's been a great leader during this time. He used to be the deputy health commissioner for the city of New York uh, in, in a past life before coming down here. And uh, we're very lucky to have some amazing medical professionals in the area, and we hope that you two can, can come back down to DC soon. <laughs> You've got your fan club. As, as. <laughs> uh, how did you want to do one more before we go to audience, or should we just go to audience? No, I had a quick question, yeah. so. Um, when we were talking about the last question, you did kind of touch on a little bit of what this question is going to ask. But um, uh, you mentioned about like the disparities of care because of the you know the lack of like diversity. And my question would be like, do you have any advice for any people or patients who may uh, have concerns of medical racism and how they can advocate for themselves when they go to get um, receive care? Yeah. Um, yeah. That. That is concerning, um, and I, I've I've seen it happen, um, and unfortunately, people have to do just what you said, which is advocate for themselves, which is really hard to do, especially if you're not in the field, um, or if you feel you don't have the power to, or you know, if you're if you, if you feel disempowered in other ways, like if, if you're elderly or if you don't really understand or you don't have the time to put in because you're busy and you're working and you're trying to figure out how to pay your bills and the last thing you want to do or you feel you can do when you're sick is to fight a battle to get care um but unfortunately that's something we have to do now there there's other actions we can take like voting we all need to vote <laughs> we all need to vote um and then nick one of the questions you asked me previously is how I find the energy to take stands. That's part of it. Those of us who do have the energy to do this work and to advocate for people and to advocate for change, um, whether it's in our local local politics, national and national in our communities, those of us who have the energy and resources to dedicate to it, we, ju we just have to do it it's the only way there will be change and it's not fair to ask people who are struggling to bear the burden of this thank you um this is just my own editorialization which i probably shouldn't be doing but um for folks who've had the chance to like experience other countries and live in other countries and such i i was very fortunate able to go to to the uk for graduate school and um there are so many things that we can learn from other systems of healthcare that we can pick and choose from in order to find the best way to take care of each other, which is what it all comes down to. And you know, whether it's the cost of prescriptions or whether it's um, making sure that people have access to, to services and such. For example, in our county right now, we have a big challenge around getting COVID support and testing even to folks who are not, um, who do not have the privilege of being fully documented. For example, we have a very large immigrant population and pretty much everything that we see from the public health sector um, initially had barriers. And then the local folks have been able to kind of figure out ways to work with nonprofit and private healthcare providers to adjust things. But it's like, it shouldn't take individual people having to do things 24 hours a day. And you know, when it's not even their job to make sure that people can get access to services. And, and this is again, like with what we talk about systemic racism, human rights issues and, and taking care of each other. That's very fundamental. And I think that's something that we can all hopefully think we should be agreeing on. But thank you. you know, I'm, I, I completely agree with you. And um, that's one, if there, if, there, if there is anything positive about COVID, 
I think that it, it has laid bare the weaknesses in our system in, in many respects. I mean, there should be access to a living wage for everyone, like with working one job. There should be health care for everyone, not tied to health care because now we have a pandemic with record unemployment and record lack of access to healthcare. That shouldn't be the case. Um, we could go on. Uh, did I say education already? Yes. <laughs> We're through that right. one. Right. I mean, these are things that we should have in this society, and hopefully, hopefully for, for people who didn't notice it before, hopefully now it is clear, which brings us back, you know, to voting and, and getting things changed. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, let's switch over to audience questions real quick. Um, so I'll put, put them up on screen and then Hal and I will alternate reading them out so you can all uh, benefit from our, our recitations at the very least. Um, so first up will be Leslie who uh, asks, given the current state of the world with a global and racial pandemic, healing from trauma is at the precipice of everyone's mind. What was the driving force behind your healing? The driving force? The driving force was, I mean, honestly, at a, at, a, at a really basic level was wanting to feel okay, be okay, and to be of service. Um, because I recognize that, you know, that, that famous saying, you can't pour from an empty cup, and you can't. And if, if I was a wreck, I couldn't help other people. I mean, maybe sometimes a little bit, but for my greatest work for much of it, I have to be solid. And it's not a one and done. Don't get me wrong. This is a journey. It never ends. The healing, the growth, the evolution is a life's work. But there has to be a certain amount of healing and work I've done before I can access and achieve my personal mission. So, so that's why. That's why I had to do it. Because if I was going to achieve my work here on Earth, I would ha I'd have to be dedicated to my own healing. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for the question. I'll put up the next one for Howard to read. <laughs> Basic one. <laughs> Hi, so um, Eva Hershey's question says, what's next for Dr. Harper? Well, what's immediately next is um, gonna do some dishes. <laughs> but after that, but moving forward though, I mean, I, I, I work full-time clinically as an ER physician. So um, I'll still be doing that. And then, but I wanna do more in this literary path. Um, I'm one of those people, I'm a little superstitious. I can't really speak about something unless it's happening, but would it be fun to to work on a series, like for there to be, for discussions around um, film rights to come to fruition. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, more writing, I've already done some essays that I've published. I feel another one brewing already. Um, I feel a, a couple, <laughs> I feel a, a couple <laughs> books that are slightly different brewing. So yes, there's more for me to do on this path. and. Um, it is interesting. This is the first time in my life when it comes to professional work that I have no idea how this path will unfold. Like in, in medicine, there's a path. You do you do X, you can go to Z. You can be a director, you can head up EMS. Like there are set paths and there's a way to get there. But for this literary path, I partially because I'm new to it, I, I don't know how to navigate it, but then also because it's not linear at all, I don't know what's gonna happen. So so it's interesting. It's interesting me really having to learn getting comfortable with uncertainty. I said it in my book and the universe said, we will deliver for you. You get to practice. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next question is from Tracy. Thank you, Tracy, for the question. Uh, what is your approach to mentoring new doctors to provide better treatment to minority patients? Uh, I think it is it's really just leading by example, honestly. I, I think the only way to mentor that is to show it. So if I'm if I'm doing that, um, it's a powerful lesson, but also to call out when there are problems and, and to name it. 
if I see someone being mistreated for any reason, um, we need to talk about it. That's a teachable moment. So, um, so I think that's what it takes. And, and it can be hard for people. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and have these difficult discussions, especially around any kind of bigotry. It is, it, it calls for a certain amount of courage, um, but it's, but it's, it, it has to happen. So that's what I think. It, that's, that's my approach. And I think that's what it takes. Uh, we're going to jump to Stacy for how to read. Stacy says, there is such a lovely calm in your writing. So I'm very interested to know about your writing process and particularly how yoga and meditation played a part of your, played a part of getting your stories on the page. It played a huge part. And actually writing itself for me is, um, a spiritual process. I mean, I suppose people say different things. You have to get in the zone or a flow state. Um, I don't know, it feels like channeling to me. And so often if I'm writing um, original work, editing, I can I can put myself on a schedule to edit. But for original work, for whatever reason, it comes to me like between nine in the morning and three in the morning. So <laughs> people I work with, you know, editors, for example, they They'll often get emails from me at two in the morning for that reason. <laughs> and it, it screws up my entire schedule. But, but when I'm writing, that's when I write best. And I usually like, burn a candle, incense. I'll play some kind of calming music um, as I write with no words because it'll interfere. So, it, so the process in and of itself for me is a meditation. And I can't plan for when it happens if I'm, if I'm really off kilter emotionally, then, then I can't write. Like there was a time with the book where I was going through a really hard time and I just couldn't write. And I kind of, I had a deadline, it was a little stressful, but I just said, that's it, you know, for two weeks I won't write until I get it back together. So, so Stacy, I feel like you were very astute in picking that up because that's exactly how my process went and still goes whenever I'm writing. Awesome. Thank you, Stacy, again for the question. Um, we're gonna try and squeeze in two last questions here, going back to Tracy White, um, who, asks, who says and then asks, uh, I look forward to reading your book. Who were important mentors to you and what is one of the key things that you learned from them? I have to say that in, in this part of my life, I think my important mentors were really people I didn't even know directly. Like they're often, I keep referring to spiritual leaders like Eckhart Tolle or Thich Han or Pema Chodron, um, James Baldwin, uh, Tony Morrison. That's really where I draw. I feel like I, I draw a lot of strength from those types of elders. And from all of them, I learned a lot about centering, presencing, oh, Audre Lorde, how could I forget Audre Lorde? And being courageous and that it doesn't really matter, um, like Audre Lorde says, if if I am afraid, if, if there's a mission that I have, then I have to do it. And it, that's all that matters. And those are lessons that have served me and continue to serve me. Um, but yeah, those are my biggest mentors and lessons at this point. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I'm just gonna read the last question real quick. Uh, and it is from our very own Roberta, who asks, what is your personal mission? My personal mission is to be of service, to heal, transcend and evolve. I just came up with those words, but that gets to the point always. <laughs> that's my that's my personal mission. That's my calling. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, I'm gonna invite Roberta to come back online here to, to wrap us up for the evening, uh, but thank you, thank you, thank you for spending this time with us. It's been a real joy and an honor to speak with you. And um, thank you, Hawa, also for, for um, co-hosting with me and um, 
Is there something you'd like to leave folks with before we do the closing remarks, Michelle? No, just uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you. And I love the DMV and I can't wait to see you all in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. Of course. And Michelle, again, we thank you so much. It was so nice because the conversation was so real and authentic and that's um, just so lovely and refreshing. Um, we want to also, uh, Sean Burns of ALA Black Caucus, just to do the closing remarks, she might be having a baby, so we'll wish her well and find out about that soon. Um, again, we want to make sure that people know that they can borrow Michelle Harper's book from PGCMLS at pgcmls.info. And you've also seen crossing the screen that you can buy the book at loyaltybookstores.com. Um, we want to also remind people that uh, Eddie Loud Jr., his virtual event on October 7th at 7 p.m. will um, happen with hosts Renee Battle Brooks of the Prince George Down and Human Relations Commission and Rhonda Evans of the Schomburg Center at NYPL. So we are so excited to be partnering. Um, I hope you write some fiction, Michelle, and I hope you stay in touch because I feel like I've known you forever. You're just that kind of person. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And thanks to the audience. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And just one last note, uh, this video will be available on the PGCMLS YouTube page, uh, and it will hopefully be airing on uh, PGCC TV in the coming weeks as well. So for folks who uh, might not have internet, you can direct them towards uh, the, our local public access uh, station there. And thank you again to Michelle. Let us know if you need anything from the library system ever at all, and we hope to have you at an in-person event when we are in a better place with public health in this country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Bye.